Hi, I'm Peter Dunwoody. I'm an affiliate professor at the University of Washington, and I consult with many state and federal agencies and nonprofits on conservation management of natural areas. The first title I had for this talk was, What do we do with our zombie preserves? I started thinking about this concept uh, several years ago when I found myself in a kayak thrashing through brush thickets looking for an endangered rabbit in a riparian preserve that was entirely submerged under about four feet of water. Needless to say, we didn't find any rabbits. And I, I think we all can name a few natural areas like this that were established to protect a single rare species that has now been extirpated. These sites have become the walking dead and they're forever draining our stewardship resources while yielding negligible ecological benefits. But upon further thought, I realized that the problem was more than just these zombie preserves and related more broadly to the management challenges confronting many of our small natural areas, and especially in a time of rapid climate change. So in this talk, I want to very briefly review the nature of these challenges and consider what alternatives exist for managing these areas. I'll then introduce the concept of lifeboats as a management alternative for them and describe how this idea fits into the broader context of natural area management and how our perspectives have changed. I'll cl uh, uh, finish up with some examples of what lifeboat preserve management might include and discuss how this idea may be useful in re-envisioning the purpose and redefining the management of small preserves. So in this image of prairie habitats in Western Washington, we can see an array of mostly small remnant sites isolated by residential development and encroaching conifer forest. If we zero in on one of these, the Rocky Prairie Natural Area Preserve, we can see several of the problems that we are faced by uh, such sites. In this case, the preserve is tightly sandwiched between a railroad on one side and a highway on the other. Many such prairie remnants simply cannot be enlarged to increase their size and enhance their viability. Nor are there opportunities to link them with other prairies via corridors that would facilitate the movement of species, something that will become increasingly crucial as climates change. And just as important, many of these sites may only marginally sustain significant ecological functionality. For example, it may be impossible to burn these sites where their sur the surrounding landscape has become heavily developed with houses, such as shown here, or we may find that prescribed burns cannot be carried out in ways that replicate historical fire regimes. So what alternatives can we consider for these sorts of sites in the future? Perhaps the least palatable alternative, but one that may at times be forced upon us, such as with some of our zombie preserves, is simply to abandon them altogether. Sometimes sites can be repurposed to other non-ecological objectives, such as nature education, green space, or recreation. But in this talk, I want to focus on a third alternative, which involves significantly redefining the ecological goals for these sites, which I will refer to here as lifeboats. Others have referred to such sites as arcs or refugia, so feel free to choose your favorite metaphor. So what exactly do I mean by this term? Well, lifeboats in the literal sense are where people are saved from a sinking ship. They don't spend their entire lives there, but lifeboats give them a chance to survive in difficult times. When small natural areas are managed as lifeboats, they provide similar opportunities for selected organisms and species assemblages. It's not a perfect analogy, but it draws on a concept here ex elegantly expressed by Aldo Leopold. Lifeboat preserves are where we specifically and energetically focus on saving the parts and where intelligent tinkering is both appropriate and expected. Defined more specifically, lifeboats are sites where management is focused on the establishment, maintenance, and conservation of specific taxa and assemblages of species. A key element of lifeboats is that 
that management is carried out in an experimental adaptive context. For many of these species, lifeboats could play a number of instrumental roles, helping them prevent, uh, prevent these species from going extinct and keeping genotypes and populations alive or even serving as a source of propagules for restoration elsewhere. Before elaborating more fully on the lifeboat concept, let me step back for a moment to provide a little broader context. Lifeboat preserves fall on a management continuum that ranges from gardens and arboretums on the one hand to larger acreages of pristine wilderness at the other end. Many of these early natural areas fell closer towards the hands-off end of the management spectrum, often serving as re reference areas or sites where scientific research um, could take place and where nature was allowed, uh, uh, was largely allowed to take its course. Over time, it became apparent that these early preserves were often suffering under this approach and management of natural areas has dramatically shifted uh, to, to mo a more pro proactive uh, approach that such as controlling invasive species, uh, uh, restoring ecological processes such as fire and uh, grazing ungulates, enhancing rare species populations, restoring communities uh, to some historical state, as well as increasing the size and landscape connectivity of the preserves themselves. Managing some natural areas as lifeboats then is just a logical next step as managers, restorationists, and scientists confront the challenges presented by a rapidly changing climate combined with an ever expanding array of human impacts on the landscape. I suggest that the lifeboat preserve concept is then an appropriate and valuable alternative to consider, especially for these small natural areas that may be only tenuously ecologically viable. To begin to manage these areas as lifeboats involves several important steps each of which can be difficult and at times contentious. First, we need to recognize and acknowledge the limitations and constraints of these sites. For example, is the site so small that it is unreasonable to expect it to sustain uh, itself as a complex functioning ecosystem? Second, we must identify and discard current management goals that are unattainable, unfeasible, or simply don't make any sense. And third, we need to replace these with well-defined new goals that will explicitly guide active site management to attain feasible compositional, ecological, and learning objectives. This third step, defining new goals, can be extremely challenging since it involves making difficult decisions about what species and even communities will be specifically managed for. These decisions may feel uncomfortably subjective and can push preserve management in new directions that may challenge our basic conceptions of what constitutes a natural area. To illustrate what this might look like in practice, I'll provide a few examples here of the sorts of things that might be considered for small prairie preserves in Western Washington. For example, we could undertake experimental introductions of some threatened and endangered prairie plants to add redundancy and help conserve these rare species. This could include species like the rose checker mallow and Kincaid's lupin, taxa that currently occur primarily in Oregon and are extremely rare in Washington. Another that could be introduced might be the Willamette daisy, a federally endangered species that is endemic in Oregon prairies but which might well uh, grow well in suitable sites farther north. It could also be worthwhile to consider experimental introductions of more common species, such as the showy milkweed, a species that is native just across the border in Oregon, but currently is absent entirely from prairies in Western Washington. This species could provide a host plant to support monarch butterflies, which are likely to increasingly move north from the Willamette Valley into Washington in the future. 
Introduction of non-local genotypes is another area that is worthy of exploration. For example, other strains of common camas, a dominant uh, species in many western Washington prairies, could be experimentally introduced to compare the performance of different genotypes, some of which might be better adapted to environments associated with future climate conditions. Even non-native species may be important candidates for introduction, such as the English plantain, which is already being widely planted in these prairies as a host for the federally endangered Taylor's checkerspot butterfly. These examples illustrate just a few of the many important areas in ecological restoration where studies are already desperately needed. Small isolated lifeboats where there is minimal risk of escape may be especially suited for studying assisted migration, experimenting with non-local genotypes and non-native species, or the creation of novel communities altogether. They also could be places for testing intensive management practices that may be difficult to implement at bigger scales on larger preserves. To conclude, I've suggested a couple of main reasons why the lifeboat preserve concept could be a valuable management alternative to consider for many small natural areas. First, the very existence of some of these preserves is at risk, and the lifeboat concept provides important justifications for retaining them by identifying critical new roles that enhance their ecological and scientific value. And second, Lifeboats can provide valuable learning opportunities for exploring important new conservation strategies. I want to especially thank several of my colleagues, Tom Kay, John Bacher, and Adam Martin for discussions we've had uh, regarding this concept. And I'd certainly welcome any comments or questions uh, that you can email me at this attached uh, address. Thank you. <laughs>